Welcome to the Computer Repair Podcast, episode number 281, End of Life Transition. I'm your host, Jeff Alish. This is our live show where we discuss the ins and outs of running your computer repair business. Computer Repair Podcast is brought to you by Ninja RMM, the simple-to-use remote monitoring and management solution. This is all the tools you need in one place to provide preventative maintenance for your clients. Try it free at ninjarmm.com forward slash one zero off. And also by Malwarebytes TechBench, the comprehensive partnership program for repair shops looking to boost margins and grow their business. This includes a portable tool set to help you diagnose, remediate, and secure PCs. Malwarebytes TechBench built for technicians by technicians. Sign up today at malwarebytes.com forward slash TechBench. Let me introduce the co-host. We have John Dubinsky from the Maven Group. How are you doing, John? I'm so anxious to get here. Let's just get right into the tips. I'm so excited. I mean, right. it's been two weeks, Jeff. I mean, I've been sitting by the microphone waiting for you to call and or send the show link. I mean, <laughs> hey, should I give a disclaimer that I use both of those products and enjoy both of them as well? I, I do too. So, I mean, I mean, we've been, we've been waiting for, I mean, who doesn't want to be in the dojo and who doesn't like malware bites, right? That's right. I, I think yeah. everybody that that knows, yeah, definitely knows. So definitely, uh, and if you don't, there's always new people listening to the show, though. Definitely check those links out because you might learn something new. Or if you haven't used either of those products before or in a long time, hey, check them out. They're pretty cool. Hey, yeah, in all seriousness, both of them, in my opinion, are worth at least a look. See yeah. if they can fit into your, into, your, into your process. Absolutely. All right, John. So since you are my only wonderful co-host today. Why don't you share a tip or story with us that we could learn from? I got three quick ones as usual this week. Uh, the first one is um, I am a Google. Uh, let's talk about home automation. I am not a Bradford Tory. By the way, Bradford, happy birthday. Today's your day, buddy. Enjoy it. Um, I am not a home automation guy, but I am in the Google realm of home, home automation. If Nest puts it out, I'll probably buy it because that means it's easy to implement and just works with what I have. So I have a ton of the Google Home Minis throughout my house. Um, and there's a cool, I'll put a link in the show notes, a cool mount for them uh, that uh, does, hooks it up to one single outlet, controls the cable, makes it nice and neat. And I just put it in the show notes and it's pretty cheap. It's like five to 10 bucks. So if you are in the Google Home aspect, this is a winner. John, let me ask you a question. What do you do on your Google Home? I'm just curious because I'm going to tell you what I do on my Alexa and other devices. Uh, if I had to be totally honest, it's a glorified speaker. Really? Um, I do use some of the voice commands, usually for nothing that I couldn't do easily on my phone. But they're nice to have when you need them. Yeah, they're, solving, they're definitely solving a first world problem for me. Okay, so I have an Amazon Alexa and or Echo. And so I, I'm sorry, I should have said the word. Anyways, basically, I use it hey, in Google? the kitchen for either listening to music while I'm in the kitchen or for setting timers. Maybe asking the weather, but really, that's about it. I do do the weather. I don't know why, but I ask about the sunset and sunrise all the time. It is pretty kick butt for the timers if you got your hands full and you can do multiple timers. Yes. It, and it works when I'm doing, when I'm grilling, when I'm cooking something on the stove or whatever. I love it for that. Cause you can set, like you said, as many as you want and they'll just keep going off. And now the only thing that's irritating about them, I don't know if you have this problem. Whenever you go to stop the timer, because it's usually audibly loud. A lot of times you got to tell Alexa a couple times to actually do that. <laughs> oh, I'm screaming. Hey, Google. A lot of times when the music is loud to turn it down. <laughs> So you normally got to either walk in. Yeah, I get you. I get you. All right. So tip number two. Uh, tip number two. Uh, I get a lot of questions from guys listening to the show and some other guys on the changes that are happening in G Suite. There's a bunch of them that are happening now, especially with Hangouts and things like that. Quick uh, little tip. I mean, it's pretty darn obvious, but I'm always surprised at how many people don't know about it. But the G Suite blog, a link in the show notes right now and in the chat. I mean. There's probably six, seven, eight posts a week about the new features and improvements they're making. It's a great place to start. There's about a billion places to track this, but this is, you're getting it right from the horse's mouth here. So pretty awesome. easy one, but it's the best place I've found. 
And the last one I got is an, uh, an app um, for your phone, for the web, and a Chrome plugin. And it's they're not inventing anything new, but the name of the product is called Wakelet, W-A-K-E-L-E-T. And what it is, is it's to save your bookmarks. So as you're cruising around the internet, um, you know, you can click the Chrome, you can do it on, uh, use the share feature on your phone, so on and so forth, and save where you've been if you want to come back and look at an article. Obviously, something that we all do and probably use 100 different things to do like I have, like you can use the Google Save feature, so on and so forth. But what I like about Wakelet, and I'm only probably about a week into using it, so I'm not giving it my full two thumbs up, John approval rating, but... When you go to the Wakelet page, either on your phone or on the web to review everything you've done, the cool thing is it gives a full description of the page you saved, plus the link, plus it makes it very easy to browse to that with a right click, which you can't do from Google Saves. You have to actually click on the box and then it opens the page in the same page. It just has a lot of nice features. And if you wanna take it even further, it's kind of a quasi Instagram. You can save your groups of saves and share them with other people and all that kind of good stuff. So it could be, if you're working on a project or something, it could be a nice way to group things, but just something to check out, wakelet.com. All right, cool. Yeah, very good. All right, so for my uh, tip or story, I guess, is, uh, I mentioned this probably, I don't know if I mentioned it last, last time I was on a couple weeks ago. Um, basically John had sold me a nice tablet for my wife. It's a 10.8 inch tablet. It's a Dell, um, business class. What, what it's a latitude, right? It's a latitude. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, got the keyboard and everything with it. And he also sold me a dock. So I had got this bright idea. I said, well, told my wife, I said, you know what, here's what we can do. So we got this dock. I tried hooking it up to a 20 inch monitor and it didn't do it justice. So I decided, I said, all right, honey, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to buy you a 55 inch TV. I'm going to mount it on the wall. We're going to hook the dock up to it. Now I'm going to get you a keyboard. And I found a really cool Logitech keyboard with the trackpad attached to it, not the K400, which I use here in my office but it's the K850 or 830, I'm sorry, 830. Now this particular keyboard is cool because it lights up when you touch it. So now you're sitting in the dark in the Ooh. bedroom. You've got the big 55 inch screen TV as you're sitting in the bed typing you know, to YouTube or searching on Amazon or doing whatever you want to do. And it's right there in your face and it's, it's really cool. So it's a nice little setup. Now I did buy it. my 55 inch was a, uh, it's a TCL Roku brand TV. And I'll tell you what, for the price, this thing was $400 from Amazon out the door. Can't beat it. I'm on that bandwagon too. I have two of them. I have the smaller one that we have in my office and my wife's office with the Roku built in. Boy, for the t price, it's, you can't beat it. And here's the thing. So instead of my wife having to sit in the bed with now, it's not like she is in the bed all the time, but she's there <laughs> in the evenings when she's relaxing, right? Because somebody else might be using the TV in a family room or whatever. But instead of having three remotes, now she has one and it does the TV. It does everything on there. She can grab her tablet and sit there and, you know, do whatever. Or she can just turn it on, use her wireless keyboard and surf the Internet to her heart's content. So I think um, this was. So what a, are you using for one remote? Just with the remote that comes with the TV. The Roku, that's a beautiful yeah. thing. That's all you got to yeah, do, it's, right? It's the Roku remote just yeah. with the power button. And what's cool about it too is we watch a lot of Netflix. Watched a little bit of Hulu. I'm thinking about getting rid of that. That's another story. But it's got a Netflix, a Hulu button, a sling button on it. So all you got to do is you can push these and it goes right to the app. Not like it's hard to uh, search. Now I will tell you, that it's even better if you use the Roku app because here's why. It gives you a keyboard that you can type into instead of going through the click menu and clicking one letter at a time Ooh, to yeah. do a search. It is awesome. So, and that's Google Play or uh, iOS. Both of them have it. Uh, definitely highly recommended. And like I said, dude, I, this is a 4K TV and I'm not a big 4K fan or anything like that. I'm like, quite honestly, HD is perfectly fine. Yeah, so you got the newer model. 
it, it, but it's you know what it's a newer model but it's a 2017 model yeah so i bought mine a little earlier but i got a 32 inch for 139 bucks for my office yeah can't beat yeah. it man can't I'll put beat the it. link in the show notes all right cool but so that that was my uh my purchases uh for my wife the over the last couple of weeks and i was finally able to uh put that together for her. now my wife has spent most of her time on the phone and she'll be on her phone all the time. Why? Because it's, it's there. It's convenient. It's what she can, it's what she has with her. Problem is whenever she wants to print something, it becomes this big hassle. So this kind of solves those problems where she can now go to her tablet and she's training herself to use the tablet a little bit more. She can print from there. She can do whatever. It's a windows machine. And really, it's the best of both worlds. I don't particularly, I was telling John, I don't particularly like it in tablet mode. I, it's just, it's not. I don't think I ever, it. when I had mine, I don't think I ever used it in tablet mode. We, we tried rarely. and it just, it it leaves something to be desired. That's all I can put it to you that way. But now, like anything else, somebody could train themselves to use it in that fashion. But I like it with a keyboard. I like it as a computer a mobile computer, a docked computer that you can put on a big screen or whatever. So for that, for that aspect, it works. So that was my, that was my story. Um, let's go ahead and take a quick break and then let's get into our main topic. Our show today is brought to you by Ninja RMM, the easy to use single pane remote monitoring and management solution to help you become more efficient, more productive, and more profitable. Ninja RMM understands what you need to help your customers which is why their RMM solution is integrated with tools you use every day. With Ninja RMM, you can have a faster fixed response time and offer preventative maintenance to your customers. Ninja RMM provides patch management, antivirus, email, SMS alerting. You can be up and running quickly with minimum training time, which is a bonus for me. Plus, there are no contracts, so you can focus less on your stress and more on your customers. They also have things like TeamViewer for that remote support. Backup using the Cloudberry system, antivirus, WebRoot. These are great things that we're using all the time anyways. And so now they're all integrated into this particular product. Everything all in that one single pane of glass, as John likes to say. Uh, you have network visibility inside your RMM, easy to read dashboards, and a powerful device search to create custom queries and export the list to keep your customers up to date on the hard work you do for them. So they know you're not just letting a program just run itself. Basically, all the things that it does, it's doing it automatically. But you can produce something that says, hey, here's what we do for you all the time. So next time you think about leaving, uh, you might not want to. Ninja RMM is offering Podnets listeners a free 30-day trial. When you decide to buy a 10% discount to take advantage of this offer, go to ninjarmm.com forward slash one zero off. All right, our main topic today, we want to talk about Windows 7 end of life and getting clients to transition to Windows 10. This was the number one subject that came up for last month's survey in the secret Facebook group. So we wanted to talk about it. John, Windows 7, Windows 7 end of life. You want to roll off some stats? You want to start there and then? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. Okay. Um, if anybody's not aware, this is the time that if you've got some deployments of Windows 7 still out there, especially if you're dealing with any compliance needs, that uh, your deadline is January 2020. Uh, end of life, no more updates. Obviously, I think most of us know that does not mean that we are going to detonate on that particular date and everything is going to stop working. But I would suggest what I'm doing with a lot of my clients, unfortunately, I still have a couple that are hanging on to server 2008 which is already of end of life. Um, as a side note or a tangent, server 2012 will end of life on 2023, January 2023. So back to the Windows 7 bandwagon, now would be to start talking to your clients about, hey, let's do one computer a month. Look, that gives us 12 plus months. We're only in June, so 18, 17 months to roll. Look, that's one PC, whether we need to upgrade that PC just software wise or we have to buy new hardware, we can offset this and we can roll. We can ease the pain of doing this, especially if they have no Windows 10 computers in their uh, in their deployment at this time. 
Um, what I run into with this, Jeff, a lot of the time is I'm, if I'm taking somebody from a Windows 7 deployment, the big thing might be some incompatibility with devices, meaning like in the dental world, like an intraoral camera may no longer work with Windows 10 or something to that aspect. Um, and usually those are pretty heavy purchases, you know, two, three, four, five, six grand for an intraoral camera for a nice one, depending on its features. So a lot of the times there's a lot of resistance to that. So if you can get out in front of that with your customers as soon as possible and or their vendors, uh, that's a big deal as well, which may offset that pain. John, do you have, are those, those cameras, do they have to be network connected? They are not network connected, but usually what it is, is the uh, manufacturers do not provide drivers for the latest operating systems, especially if you're still stuck on 32-bit. Uh, meaning like if you had a camera that's working on Windows 7 32-bit, you got a 50-50 shot, whether you're going to Windows 10 64-bit. Uh, now there are cheaper cameras. I mean, there are some cameras you can get on Amazon for two, three, four hundred bucks. But a lot of that is up to the dock and their preference. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of those guys are really into the extremely high quality image where they might want something that integrates precisely into their particular practice management software. Like if you're running a Dexis software, you might want a Dexis cam, a Dex cam. So, you know, and those are not uh, what I would call on the cheap end of the spectrum. And, and, this, and this cover, go ahead. I'm just thinking that if, if you have a Windows 7 machine that's running this software for a camera, you don't really need to necessarily, you could go past end of life, correct? And just kind of keep running it until, as long as it's not network connected, are, is there anything HIPAA wise or otherwise that would cause a problem? The problem is, is that PC is going to be network connected. It has to be okay. because you're running a practice management product, um, you know, whether that's web based or on prem. So it's going to be connected. And I mean, come on, it's time. I, you I'm, know, I'm with you. I agree. Um, I agree. You know, and I'll jump on the bandwagon. I was listening to a couple of other shows from our, uh, you know, the group of shows from our friends, and a couple of them were getting on the bandwagon of getting mad at uh, Windows for, uh, especially in this latest 1803, they really deprecated some of the old uh, SMB sharing. SMB 1.0 is to if you do a fresh install, SMB 1.0 is totally disabled. So a good example of that would be, let's say you're in a server 2012 environment you install a brand new fresh 1803 install. Um, by default, it's depending on how your 2012 environment is configured, that computer will not network to that 2012 server. If you're still using SMB1 on that 2012 server, you have to go into the Windows 10 box and add a feature and, and add the SMB client 1.0 manually. Could by default, it's not there. Now, all of those are little pitas that we got to deal with. On that side of the house, I agree that those are welcome changes, in my opinion. Now, what everybody else complains about, including myself, as far as adding Barbie's Dreamhouse uh, games every time I do an update or, or Disney. I mean, I'm a Disney fan as big as anybody else, but uh, I don't need their games on my pro PCs. You know, there are ways to, to remove that, but I got better times to spend managing devices rather than going through and removing Windows 10 games that get added. We shouldn't have to do that stuff. Even on the home version, I would argue that those are not those you could leave in the Windows store and you could go get them on your own. You could, I, you know, I don't know. There's got to be a better way to do it because I, I'm not going to use any of those apps. I think I've used one game on this particular computer for playing one of those. I can't remember what the name of the game was, but one of the games that you showed me a long time ago that we played on our tablets and phones and whatnot. Oh, War Incorporated. Yeah. 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 So we, we, you know, that's the only one that I've ever loaded on a machine. And it's like, I went and had to get that particular game. So having Candy Crush and all this other stuff. Now let's face it. It's all about advertising. I get it. But at the same time, come on, just make it available. Well, there's in a store, big, but keep big it versus free. circle there. You know, if you're on an actor, Active Directory domain and using group policy. I mean, you can restrict users into what they can install and control all that. Uh, but again, a lot of the times, and you can just and you can disable a lot of this stuff on an ongoing basis. You know, it's ever changing because Microsoft wants this to show up. But you know, I don't need the pop-ups of my users. You know, seeing to integrate their cell their cell phone into the computer like you get after this latest Windows 10 update, because then if I'm restricting that and it doesn't work, that's going to cause a ticket to come into me, or you know, it's just going to be it's just a mess. 
you know, especially in, I might see it if there wasn't an AD environment or maybe for the home users, I might be able to adjust it, justify it a little bit more as in, I understand they have to make money, but there seems like there's got to be a better way, you know, have their one place or, you know, allow, I don't know. I'm with you. Even, even on residential like a little side, bit of a mess. Oh, yeah. Even on residential side, the reality is people still call about those things. They're like, Hey, this is, you know, my, my Cortana microphone's not working. Uh, Okay. Well, I, I always get back to the old thing is way back when you remember when we always told everybody don't click on the pop-ups. Yes. Don't do anything with that. And it's, it's probably still good advice even in today's day and age, but now who's providing more pop-ups than anybody else? Microsoft. Yeah. My operating system and whether they're legit or not, you know, and I would suggest most of my business owners don't want them either because what's that doing? It's just interfering with productivity and causing those squirrel moments for their for their employees. So stop it, Microsoft, stop it. Well, and I go back to, I, you know, I don't think Microsoft was the first one to start that. I think in this latest iteration, Windows 10, this has definitely become a, a problem. And like you said, you can shut that off, but in my opinion, it still should be off by default and you can turn it on if you need those services. If you're not using them, it's just a waste of time and resources. But the ones that really get me, and this is a side tangent, antivirus companies. Been telling our customers for a bazillion years not to click on pop-ups. And for whatever reason, antivirus companies feel that, hey, we're going to pop something up to give you some information on the latest, greatest threats out there or whatever. It's like, okay, you have a pop-up it, that comes up in the middle of the screen if there's a problem, like if something's caught. But I'm still a fan of, you know what? Catch it, throw it away. I'll deal with it later. The customer doesn't need to see that stuff. It, but again, it's all about that. Let's get that mind share out there. Let's get the, this product, whatever it is, in front of the customer. And I get it. It's how they make money. But man, there's got to be a better way. Just because advertising has worked for the last however many thousands of years doesn't mean we need to keep continue to do it that way. Well, there's two avenues there. One depends on the product. Is it a product that's being installed on a personal machine? Or are you installing a consumer product into a non-consumer environment and expecting the same results? So if you use a managed product, and I would suggest I'll pick on Malware Bytes and full disclosure, I'm a Malware Bytes user and I would throw all my weight behind them with a recommendation, at least at this point. But I use their corporate product, which I really like because, you know, even if I expose as much as there is to expose to the end user, all they can do is do a scan. They can't even get into a control panel or do anything. And I can actually turn that off where there's not even an icon in the tray and they can't do anything, which which I, I go back and forth on depending on the week and what I want to do. But either way, you know, that's a little bit different than a consumer product, which is going to do what you're saying, Jeff, which is going to pop up that message. And I think uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't the malware bytes consumer product do that too? pop up a bunch of messages and provide a bunch of options. And they, they maybe all do as far as I know, or okay. they all did at one time or another. I'm not sure. I just know that there's some in some are worse at it than others. I'll just put it that way. Well, some people might really like that because they want to know the product's working and they like the involvement at home. But there, in my opinion, there should just be a button that says quiet that you could just do and just make it go away and just do what you're supposed to do and alert me if there's a, an emergency. Thanks. I'll, I'll continue to pay for your product. Just leave me alone. And tell me if something's wrong. Well, in that, I guess that's the problem too. Again, it goes back to this comes full circle in the cheap consumer or even cheap computer repair business owner is that nobody wants to pay for anything. So these companies are, are scrambling to try to get their product in the front of your face all the time, which is the same thing we do for our customers. Hey, we want, we want to be there so that when you have a computer problem, you're going to give us a call. So we, we do that in, in several different ways through marketing, through leaving, um, you know, icons on the desktop or whatever. And so I, I get, I get it. It's just, yeah, there, there's gotta be a way to, uh, just make it a little easier. But anyways, go back to, go ahead. Let me add one more thing. But I'll take that full circle that I, I understand that the vendors or whatever are trying to find a way to make more revenue or maybe stay uh, top of mind on that. And I get that. And I don't disagree with that because I want my vendors to make money. Obviously, I want Mailwarebytes. I want Ninja. I want them to make some revenue. 
um, not on my back, but on a fair, in a fair sort of way, because I want them to be there to take care of me and I want them to keep innovating and I want them to keep developing. And I want Microsoft to make a buttload of money too, because I want their products solid and better. And I want them to keep updating and innovating as well. But, you know, there's so much noise there that if there was another choice, you know, I, I might look, I might be looking, but there really isn't. And they kind of know that at least for the business environment. And don't email me and say that I can switch to Linux or Mac, not in the environments I'm in, but I get that. Yeah. We won't even go there. <laughs> okay. We support yes. windows because windows supports pretty much the entire universe. So get over it. Um, and I'm, and I'm down with it. There are some things that Mac does better. There's, you know, it's like choosing the best tool. We've talked about this before. If you like snap on by the snap on, if you want to use craftsman, if the, you know, if the Mac's better, let's use it. So on and so forth. I'm down with that. But in the environments I work in, it's active directory group policy, or it's, you know, windows for sure. So John, now you, you gave a good point about letting people know, let's, let's replace a computer a month for windows seven, going to windows 10 and building that in. Now, with the scenario that you painted with the cameras, is that something that you could let them know, hey, let's put a few hundred dollars or whatever it is, or you know, whatever, a few thousand dollars away every once a month, every other month, something like that, bringing it, it putting a revenue off to the side so that they know, hey, we're going to have to replace this. And this is just what we're going to have to do and not waiting till the last minute. Well, so far, I've done this a couple of different ways, um, just from my experience. And then at the end, remind me to say something, uh, to comment on something that I think we all do horribly. Uh, okay. All right. So the, uh, one example that I've done is I had a, I have a club. They are a fitness slash dining slash wedding. I mean, it's a nice, very nice facility, but, um, and they had a bunch of point of sale machines that were all old Windows 7 32-bit computers. And so we talked about this and it was time to do an upgrade. And they said, well, we're not going to have any budgetary money to do any of this because they run on a fiscal year until, I don't remember, I think it's February of next year. Uh, but they're a good customer. I've been a very good long-term customer. So I said to them, I said, well, what, what if we just do this? Because I had a really good deal from Dell on getting some replacement computers and say, I'll buy them for you now. I'll charge you just a touch a bit of extra money to carry that cost and then I'll, you could pay me in February. So that was one way I solved the skin the cat. Uh, I have another dental office that we're doing the one a month type of thing where he said, yep, I'm on it. Let's do one a month. And um, actually, uh, he he's pretty proactive. Uh, he does it kind of begrudgingly, begr but he also knows that he needs to do it. But then again, I'll, sometimes I'll get an email that says, John, do two this month or something like that. So I'm sure he's watch, he's the kind of guy that's watching his numbers and probably just wants it done sooner than later. Um, but the ones I think we have to be careful on are the ones that are kind of ignoring HIPAA or any compliance needs they have at this point and don't wanna make any changes. And then at some point you're gonna get the call where they say, yep, we need all that changed and our server upgraded and they're calling you on Thursday and they say, can you have it done by Monday? You know, those kind of people. I don't have a whole lot of that in the organizations I deal with since my, all of mine are pretty much contract or relationship based. But to get back to my thoughts on what I think we do horribly, um, I would suggest that those of us that have been in, uh, in the business long enough, let's say 10 years ago, we would have told everybody, are you insane to sign up for a monthly type of bill? Just pay me when you need me. And for the... And it's not, that's what we said. That's what we told everybody. <laughs> are you insane paying something Monday? You know, <laughs> how dumb are you? <laughs> so now we're getting to the, you know, MSP, throw up in your mouth, whatever you want to call us. We are, we all like the revenue, uh, recurring revenue, but it actually is now wise or sage advice to tell our customers, at least in my opinion, that, hey, look, you need to be paying for this monthly because things have changed. And what I mean by that is, Simple exa example is, what is it, a VPN filter? This new threat where uh, even the FBI has the public service announcement that you need to reboot your router and then you need to go out and find out the new firmware for it and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if I have any users, one, that I would want to reboot my router. And of course, this isn't going to affect any of my corporate users, but I'm just thinking about it at home because inev inevitably they'll hit the reset button or do something dumb. They, they don't know what rebooting the router means. Let's just be honest. And then we're gonna ask them to go update the firmware. 
And let's move along all of that line. Um, I use a Microsoft uh, wireless desktop 850 keyboard, and that is probably the keyboard I have deployed in about probably 80% of the endpoints that I deploy that have a wireless keyboard. Well, lo and behold, there's a firmware update for the keyboard to fix the security issue. And it's a process. You got to go get it. You got to go download it. There's no way to deploy it. It takes interaction. You have to remove the batteries. So, so not only are we upgrading wireless keyboards, but now we have to upgrade printers, access points, routers, switches. Um, you know, I, I could go on. How long is the list? There's probably 500 items in an office, uh, cameras. I mean, go on and on and on. So, yes, um, I, I think it would be great to be able to charge customers hourly for that, but they're going to pay 10 times what I'm probably charging them monthly. So going back to the end of life transition, we do a horrible job at explaining to our customers on precisely why they need to do that. I mean, we understand why the end of life transition is important from our perspective, but uh, do we really know what a dentist is doing inside of our mouth? So I don't under th think they understand what we're trying to communicate to them. So if you want, if you want a great example of that, sit down with your partner, or your wife, or whomever that may be, and explain to them why they they need to upgrade from server twenty eight to twenty twelve. And when your wife says, "Oh, I understand," you've got the sweet spot. And if your wife's in IT, that's cheating. But yes, I mean, explain it to somebody that doesn't do IT. I mean, it's, well, a, it's a tough sell it could, because, again, there's another reason is it's working and it's working really right. good if you're doing your job. So they're like, well, why do I need to fix it since it's working? I, I think one of the ways to look at that, though, John, is that if you are if you want the continued luxury of having your systems up and working on a regular basis after this 2020 time frame then we need to do this update or it's not going to be the same. It's going to be different. And, and I'll beg to differ a little bit. I think we actually needed better support on computers 10 years ago. It's just nobody wanted to pay for it. And that's not even true because there were actually companies out there back then that were already doing it. Well, I think the difference is, is back then we... I, I, and I think it still happens today. I think the problem is even a lot of technicians set something up and say, oh, it's working. I'm done. Right. And I think that's a lot of what happened, even in large organizations. And it maybe still happens to this day that, oh, it's set up. It's working. I'm done. Because 10 years ago, we certainly didn't have the proliferation of things like the worms we have nowadays. What is it? Want to cry or not pet you and all this stuff that is constantly a thing. So you can't just set it up and get, in work, get it working and then stop. I mean, getting it set up and working is like step one of 10. Now you got to go change the defaults. Now you got to harden it. Now you got to monitor it. Now you got to stay on top of it. Whereas before it was set up, working, done, bill, see when you need a new one. Right. That's a good point. Now it's, now it's set it up, get it working, configure it, secure it, change everything, monitor it, upgrade it, fix it, firmware blast it, update it again. Firmware, fix it, blast it. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Change the security, change the defaults, change from SSL to TLS. I mean, there's a lot to do between the purchase of a product and the renewal of that product now. And before it was just buy the printer, it breaks, we get a new one. You know, I go back and I look at how customers' computers ran 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was, and how their computers run today. And here's the th same thing that I see across the board is that, and here's what I tell from a residential side, if you're doing MSP residential or managed services for the residential, the one thing that I see is that a person will, will deal with a computer that runs like garbage for a long period of time before they ever bring it to you. Usually still has to be broken, can't get on the internet, Wi-Fi is not working, something really bad. And I tell my customers that are MSP clients, I'll let them know, listen, if you want your computer to work every single day, just like the day you brought it home from the store, then here's what we need to do. We need to be proactive in everything that we do in order to support you on a daily basis. That way, when you turn your computer on, you need to answer an email. You need to get something done in your business. You're going to get it done versus, oh, now. The caveat to that is Windows 10, especially on laptops, 
And I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time because I'm telling more and more people to leave their laptop plugged in and leave it on. Here's a problem. On a Windows 10 update, I just had this happen in my office. We were copying some DVDs and I was using a program and all of a sudden there was a legally, legally copy. Yes, DVDs. Just, just a backup copy. Absolutely. I wasn't doing it. So what? Anyways, there was an input output error. Okay, and now the input output error was like, hey, what's going on? Well, here's what happened. In a background, this computer hadn't been turned on in a long time. And so there was a, the 1803 update had came down, installed. Well, guess what? Especially with drivers, it's still this way today. You need to restart your computer. Because all of a sudden, hey, those drivers for the DVD burner don't work. Just in the middle of what you're doing. And so that's because that computer wasn't on. And so we're, we're having a problem right now where there are, are going to be a couple times a year where it's going to be, we're going to be doing a little bit more work than we've done in the past because these, I, I get these calls. Hey, after this last update, my computer's slow. And I know that all the updates didn't finish. It wasn't just the windows update. It might've been the iTunes update and the Adobe update and all these different things are sitting in the background, kind of doing their thing. They're doing it a little bit differently which is becoming a, a nuisance. I wish there was a way that you could force a lot of these things to just run in the background. But I think the problem is people shut their computers or worse, shut their laptops down all the time. So if it's not on, it's not getting that stuff when you're sleeping. Well, the hard part, even in my environment, is there's really not a way, at least through the platforms that I use, to schedule the big updates efficiently. Yeah. And it, you know what? Here's the thing though. That's still a process. Sure. And a lot bigger than what we've, what we've been able to do in the past. Well, most people don't realize, I should say most users don't realize is basically you're getting a whole new version of windows. Yes. So. Okay. What were we talking about? Oh yes. Yes. Windows seven end of life, uh, <laughs> transition to windows 10. Is there anything else? That, I mean, other than we need to prepare the customers, we need to talk to our customers better. We need to let them know why these things are important. Hey, do a little research online. Don't just let them know if you want to be safe, you need to upgrade. Safe from what? Well, and on top of, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and on top of all that, I would say, you know, tread slowly. You know, maybe start with one PC in the office, depending on the environment you're in. Pick one that does a lot of different things. Um, let's pick on a dental office again. Is it going to work with the NRL cameras, the x-rays, everything else that's going on in that PC? So that you don't try to roll it out on 10 PCs and all of a sudden figure out that half the equipment doesn't work. And then you are got yourself a big mess. Something like that. Um, I'm not sure there's a whole lot uh, left. I'm kind of watching the chat to see if there's any questions or comment from there. But... You know, my opinion is do it now. One, uh, try to get your customers to do it now for two reasons. One, it eases the burden on them and you. So you don't have these really big projects, but it's also a nice stream of revenue. If you're doing a new PC a month for a couple of different clients, you know, that's going to add on to your revenue. And it also allows you to maybe fill empty space in your schedule. So if not all your techs are rolling out busy and you got an empty day, you can say, well, you can schedule that day to go to do this PC update. Update. That's good. If the office you're working with is flexible. So that's the way I'm kind of managing it, looking at it. But again, I go back to, it might be nice. I, I, at least personally, I need to walk, a, a, what do they call it? A 30 second elevator interview or elevator pitch. Right. You know, I, I'm trying to convince, condense these things into 30 or 60 second conversations, just that are very easy and succinct for customers to understand. You know, I don't want to get into all the, I don't know the depths of why you need server 2016 or 12 over 2008, you know, here are the important points of why, why you need it. And, you know, end users and owners don't care about security updates and all that. They want the big picture of it's going to make the system more reliable. It's going to, you know, you're going to have more uptime, you know, the system's just going to work better. You're going to be able to fix teeth better doc. This is why we're doing it. And, you know, the other thing too, that's a good point, John, I think you, this would almost be a great opportunity to come up with something like a bullet point list of exactly the things that you're saying. Hey, maybe you can even laminate it or make it fancy or just have it as a, as a regular colorful handout with a few you know, pictures on it or something. That I'm thinking you about a t-shirt. There you go. 
well, it's a t-shirt, yeah. Check the boxes. But you could sure. actually you could hand it to a customer and go over it with them. Here are right. the reasons why. And then they've got something tangible that they're looking at. They're not just, you know that because a lot of times when we talk about this stuff, especially to our customers, they zone out. Well, I'm surprised at how often that is because I'll have a conversation with a business owner or something like that, where I really think I'm breaking it down to brass tacks and they're nodding their head and they're looking And then two weeks later, you know, however the conversation goes, you realize they didn't understand a darn thing. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that's good. So somebody that wants to make a, uh, a handout like that, uh, you know, let's get going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, if somebody else is going to do it, let's have a full video presentation, please. With PowerPoints, <laughs> accompanying PowerPoints. Well, maybe that's a great thing. You know, maybe somebody, uh, this is a good thing for the audience, I think. I think the audience, if you came up with something that you thought was a good point to let a customer know why they need to upgrade or why they need to change something in their environment, like not j like John was saying, bring it down to a point where a person can understand it. Maybe you can send an email into the show, podnuts at podnuts.com, and let us know what those are. And maybe we could compile a list together and share that in the Google Drive with everybody, put a link out there so that uh, everybody could have access to that. That way, as a group, we can collaborate as a whole. And I think the important part is to remove the tech out of it. I mean, wh why, why do you choose your RMM system? I mean, we like the cool techie parts about it, but really it's to make your life easier, to make you more money, right? That's Those right. are the same reasons that your customers want to upgrade and keep their systems up to date. So you need to transfer that information or do that knowledge transfer to give give them that information that meets their business goals, not your business goals, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Good point, John. All right. All right. Anything else to this topic? I think we've done everything we can. No, no. And I'm seeing in the chat, people are just going to, I don't want to say complaining or budget stating, you know, that same, same issues, you know, the big updates do bring issues when you do them. Um, you know, I manage about 900 endpoints. Um, and maybe uh, I might be a little skewed in my looking at it because my fleet of is pretty much all Dell Optiflex, Optiplex computers. So there's not a whole breath, but I've had very few issues, knock on wood, with the update. So I don't know what other people are experiencing or techs are experiencing, uh, especially you, uh, consumer techs. You know, Jeff, you and I have talked about it with all the different kinds of models that you got to deal with. I can't. Thank well, God and, that, for... and that's why, quite honestly, John, after you got me uh, hooked up with uh, getting refurbished laptops and stuff like that, I, I'm not going to actually recommend to customers anymore. They want a laptop. Hey, let's get a let's get a refurbished uh, Dell Latitude. And you know what? That way, hey, you're my customer and you have a problem, even even though it's residential, I can fix it a lot, a lot quicker, a lot easier because that's the that's the universe where I'm at. And for the ones that come in, hey, we we still figure them out. Some just take a little bit longer than others. And maybe there's a, a push to because by the time you talk about replacing things like a hard drive, especially from going to a spinning drive to an SSD on a consumer grade laptop that's made of plastic and will break if you look at it wrong. Maybe this is a great time to, you can get some great phenomenal deals out there for refurbished Dell Latitudes, which John, I, I seriously think I could take this laptop and beat you over the head and uh, it would still be, it would still work just fine. Not my head, Jeff, maybe the oh. average human head, but not my head. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm with you 100%. And I'll be honest, I'm probably doing 50-50 right now. Um, a lot of my customers are very receptive to the refurb and where we're using them or maybe like shop floor applications or other applications where the environment is really nasty or even uh, some sales Salesforce implementations where we know the laptops aren't going to get treated very well. So... You know, it's nice. You can buy three reverbs for the price of one. And really, when you're getting a Core i7 with an SSD and a uh, 16 gigs of RAM for a third the price of a new box, it's pretty, you know, it's tough to beat. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, okay. I think we killed, uh, beat the end of life transition to death. Um, if we missed anything, just have uh, shoot us a note. We'll pick it up on the next show. Absolutely. What do you think? Okay. Did you get a new chair? Yes, I did. All right. Nice. It's a Secret, Secret lab. lab. Secret right. lab.
yeah, I decided to, uh, this one actually has a built-in lumbar support. Um, it's kind of like, it's almost like the one you have in your car where you can roll it out and it, uh, well, one in my car has got a push button, but this one you can roll out and it kind of gives me that lower back, uh, support and it gives me a, uh, a, a good, it's a firm cushion, but I, it, it's, it's helping me to sit correctly. Let me put it that way. Uh, I cannot confirm or deny that I might have, you know, some back issues I've been working on over the last uh, couple of years, but hey, everything's working out okay. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take a quick second. If you guys and gals out there are getting something out of this show and you want to become part of a unique secret Facebook group and you want to just support what we're doing, then go to patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast this is a uh in a forum where we can talk openly ask questions get questions answered people come up with some unique spins on things and uh the one thing i can tell you is that i people always make me think differently than what i'm used to and so i get something from everybody asking questions getting answers and also trying to sometimes to figure out how to answer a question it's amazing when I think about the, the, the amount of stuff that I know, and there's a lot of times where it's like, I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> I run into that all the time. So, uh, but it, it helps me in my business because it helps me think about things. But anyways, if you guys would love to do that, it's a buck a show. It's only when we do the show. So, um, you know, no more than $4 a month and, you know, price of a, a cheap coffee. Uh, but anyways, patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast. And we appreciate all of our Patreon supporters for your continued support. You guys and gals are doing an awesome job and we really, really appreciate it. Well, the cool thing is there's a couple of users out there that are posting some audio, uh, some audio questions out there, which was pretty cool, you know, telling yeah. their stories in long format and audio versus typing it out. So that was pretty neat. Because yeah, that was cool. That was very uh, cool. All right, so yeah, I noticed you recommended them come on the show because he had a pretty good story, which might be a good thing to talk about. Absolutely, and that's a good point, John. You know, for the rest of you out there, not only in the secret Facebook group, but just in the community in general, if you would like to bring a topic and come on this show and talk about something that's near and dear to your heart, then this is something where we can break it down and talk about it, and that's usually where the best ideas come out of. Because people getting together, getting the ideas off their chest, and everybody kind of giving their two cents about maybe what they would do or maybe what could be done differently in the in the future, I think that would be awesome. So I'm putting that out there again, and I know a lot of people are going to say you're shy. Here's the one thing I can tell you. Ask anybody that's ever come on this show and ask them. I've had some, I've had some pretty big shooters that are you know a lot bigger than than what i do here um come on the show and said oh my gosh i was so nervous to do this and i'm like really <laughs> you you i didn't notice but here's the one thing a lot of people will say they always say at the end of it that was a lot of fun i'm so glad i came on and did the show so again we make it very easy we let you know, uh, you know, how to get in and it's, it's very easy to do. And we just have a good time sitting around and mulling over things that happen either in our businesses or things that we're thinking about for the future. I mean, you're kind of a jerk, Jeff, but if you come on, I'll make sure everything's okay. That's so, right. John is the, the <laughs> cool, cool man, Luke. He just kind of, he'll, he'll fluff you and, and take care of you and, and prop you up. And I'll tell you, what are you doing? Jeff, I'm almost 50. I'm not sure I'm fluffing anybody anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, we got some emails to go into. So let's yes. go ahead and do that. And John, I'm going to let you kick it off with something that was sent to you. Jeff, who's that first email from? <laughs> let me pull that <laughs> up, John. No, I'm sorry. I didn't want to crucify his name. I wanted you to. It's from Adil. A H Our chow. is he? Our chow. Our chow. Uh, it's just showing our ignorance. Uh, I apologize, Adil, but you had a great question. And uh, he was, hey, John, uh, we don't know each other, but that's all right, Adil. I um, hope you're listening today. 
I'm thinking about joining HIPAA for MSPs Pro and wanted to see if you had any insights and such. Is it really worth it? Well, first of all, I'll give a shout out to David Sims. Anybody that was at the last unconvention, he was a presenter there. So he was a, he, and he does a great job. Um, not that I want anybody to listen to another show, but if you go listen to the double D's, uh, that's Donna and David over at helpmewithhippa.com. They have a fantastic HIPAA-based podcast, which is great and easy listening. Probably much more entertaining than this one, but certainly not as useful. Uh, but Double D, Donna and David, they do a great job over there. To circle back to HIPAA for MSPs, I'm a member. I've been a pro member, um, and I'll probably be a pro member again. Um, a couple of things. One, it's no risk. First of all, if you have anything to do with HIPAA compliance, you're crazy not to go over there and sign up for a free account or at least log in and check out what's going on because there are some basic resources you get just for signing up. David does a great job on that. If you become a pro member, there is even more available for you, including uh, some counseling calls that are scheduled. So you can get on with David and a bunch of other guys and say, hey, what are we doing for this? What are we doing for that? Um, and then they also keep you in the loop on either meetups or other things that they're doing. So would, would I suggest that it is a good way to go? Yes. Um, and, and it's risk-free. There's a money-back guarantee and David's a good guy, so you're not gonna get screwed out of that or, or uh, taken advantage of. Now, with that said, if you are the kind of guy that I am, that you might need some more hand-holding, meaning uh, you're super busy and you always say you're gonna take the training, whether it be on tech TV or something else, and you never get around to it and you need something that's a little bit more, holds your feet to the fire, um, there are other options uh, that might be better for you. Meaning, uh, I I'm dealing with a company right now called the Compliancy Group, and I'll put some links and all that into the show notes, just to help get my basic stuff in line. And basically, I have scheduled calls with an implement somebody that's helping us implement, and somebody on my staff does those with me, my wife, and uh, she, you know, and it and it's been great because I have not been disciplined enough to use help. HIPAA for MSPs on my own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get through my big first uh, HIPAA hurdle, get some guidance from the compliancy group, probably recommend them to my clients. And then I'm going to go back to HIPAA for MSP, HIPAA for MSPs for ongoing. So um, that's what I did. But there's other companies that do that as well. Um, if you look at a company, <laughs> and the reason I'm chewing this one is basically just based on its name. There's a site called ultrascary.com. Uh, and they do some compliancy and they and they do a bunch of stuff, but uh, they do compliancy, security and dark web scanning and all that kind of cool stuff. But there are a bunch of companies out there to hand that can help you with this. My first caveat is, is don't deal with any company that says they're going to get you HIPAA certified because that immediately means they have no idea what they're talking about. All right. Because there is no such thing as a HIPAA certification. All right. And you'll learn that immediately when you jump on the uh, HIPAA for MSPs group. So stay away from all those companies and that'll eliminate about 80 or 90 percent of them right away. If you have any questions, you can poke me on my email. I'm happy to do this uh, or help anybody out with that. But yeah, to circle back to answer the question. Yes. HIPAA for MSPs. Fantastic choice. David does a great job. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Let's go into a second email. And uh, this is from Alex Albert, and I believe he's in the chat room with us today. He says, hey, Jeff, thanks for, for reading my second email on your show. I'm glad it was helpful, and hopefully we can find similar sites for other manufacturers. I have a question that's time for you and your co-hosts. What do you all do for disposing of old equipment? Too often I run into an issue where there's a stack of items from past repairs, like batteries, and not a clue how to get rid of them. Any insights into this matter would be greatly appreciated. Thanks again for all the great information you provide and look forward to hearing your next podcast. Regards, Alex Albert. So Alex, this is a tough one for me. Not too long ago, they actually made it a little bit easier to get rid of and recycle electronics. And it, it depends on the area you're in. I'm in a fairly large area and it is like pulling teeth to actually recycle stuff. Now, here's a couple of things you can do that are in probably most areas. A couple of things I've done over the last couple of years, because I have a basement full of stuff. I've gotten rid of a lot of it responsibly. One was my city once a year has a recycle drive 
where you can basically drive up and drop stuff off from chemicals to CRT monitors to computers, chips, whatever. There's uh, you, you can just go up, load your car, truck up, drop it off. And I've done that. I also had a drive, an electronics recycling drive come through my work. And it was funny because I, I actually packed the back of my escape up when I went to work because I knew they were going to be there. And I drove up and these six guys were getting ready to unload my vehicle and their eyes just got super wide. They're like, where'd you get all this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, it's been around for a while. And they're pulling stuff out there. Oh, I haven't seen one of these in like 15 years. I'm like, yeah, it's <laughs> so, so I have looked around and I've made, and actually my wife has made several phone calls to supposedly recyclers in the area. The problem is the recycling business has changed slightly. Recyclers normally are doing the big corporate jobs. In other words, they're going and coming into a Ford Motor Company or a GM or a Chrysler or whomever. And they're grabbing, you know, we replace our computers every three years there. So they're grabbing all this stuff. That's the stuff they're recycling. I'm like going, I didn't want, I didn't want any money for it. I just wanted a place to drop it off that I knew somebody was going to take care of it. Now we also have in my area, uh, Tom Lawrence, who is, has a computer shop just down the road for me, he has offered several times for me to drop stuff off there. And I, I still might do that in the future because he does have somebody that comes through and they pick up recycling once a month there. I've looked online and I know John, is, he's going to share a source with you, but even the ones that other people have shared with me, Hey, there's one close to your house. None of these people actually, even though they advertise it, they don't want to do it for the small <clears throat> guy. John. I have three suggestions. Uh, one, first, check with your computer manufacturer. Hit up their recycling page. Dell, for example, has a recycling page where it will tell you where to go. Uh, two, nationally, um, if anybody's ever heard of Goodwill, Goodwill Industries, where you take your old shoes and clothes and all that, they are an electronics recycler. They will take your e-waste. And John, I mean anything. Yes. Uh, hello, hello. Most of these places still will not take CRT monitors. Or or television. Stuff. Yeah, nobody's going to take a CRT monitor anymore, but you're just going to have to tag that and throw that away. But I'm talking about anything else from like a Zoom to a webcam, okay. cords, cables, speakers, inkjet cartridges, keyboards, scanners, printers, monitors, any type of computer, desktop computer, no matter how old. Yeah, nobody's going to take a CRT tube anymore because there's nothing in it that anybody wants. That's the problem. And there's... um. What's some of the other ones besides Goodwill? I think Salvation Army is very picky on their electronic waste, too. I don't think Salvation Army, as far as I know, is doing any okay. electronics e-waste recycling anymore. The only thing I can think is that might change on a specific location. The only thing I know is like I have a buddy in South Carolina, and his Salvation Army does it still because they have a program with a local e-waste recycler. So they're getting a benefit from that. I think that's how it's working. Regionally, there's a company called Comp Renew. And I'll put a link for that. That will that will take all your e waste again. Um, I would actually call your goodwill about your CRT because some may still take it because on a lot of the pages they will say they will take any and all e waste. So again, that will probably depend on your mun municipality that you're dealing with whether they will take it because basically it's where your goodwill has a place to send it is what the scoop is. So if you're in a municipality that will still take a CRT, Goodwill will still take your CRT. As far as batteries are concerned, lithium ion and any alkaline battery still goes into the trash now. There are very few recyclers of those anymore. And what I've been told based on that from my battery guy is there are so many lithium ion batteries now and that kind of battery left over from cars that they don't have anything to do with them, that there's actually warehouses full of car batteries used that they're trying to figure out to, what to do with. Um, the only battery that you can definitely recycle and get a nice chunk of change for are the lead acid batteries in your UPSs. So before you donate your UP, old UPSs to Goodwill or wherever you do it, pull the batteries and you can take those to a battery recycler. Even for a small one, you might get a buck or two. Nice. Bonus. So that okay. is what I know about recycling. Awesome, man. And uh, yeah, John recycles all the time. So uh, 
he definitely knows his stuff there. Definitely check that out. And if anybody knows anything, um, has any other information on that, um, you know, I, I'm going to take some of John's suggestions and I'm going to, I'm going to call and see what we can, what we can do because I've quite honestly, I've gotten frustrated into the point where I don't have time for this. And, and I'm like going, Hey, that'll fit into a garbage bag and that'll go out to my trash just fine. Uh, but I would rather to, I'd rather do it responsibly and, uh, and hopefully have a reputable company that would get rid of it responsibly. Now, let me, there's another little thing that I know, uh, Tom Lawrence, uh, he basically has a hard drive crusher and he crushes his hard drives before he, uh, does anything with those. And I think that's a good idea. I would, any customers, hard drives, I would probably, this is just me. I would probably destroy in some form or fashion. Um, you can drill a hole in them. You can beat them with a hammer. You can do a lot of different things to, after you obviously wipe them. And for those that think I totally get that. I just don't know why I feel so bad about that. I, I know. feel like I'm pretty, especially if it's a good drive. I know. I know. I'm with you. Um, now maybe using that drive for, you know, something in your, your own personal business or something like that. Maybe that's that, that might be one thing. I just don't want to give it out to anybody else, I guess. Um, but definitely wipe your drives, obviously, before you do that, too. And for those that think there's such a thing as a DOD uh, wipe, there is none. But go ahead and keep thinking there is. Um, it basically, if you wipe it properly with a proper tool and you write over every bit on those platters, it's it's all gone. So, anyways, there's that. Um, but, yeah. That's not what they did on the born. Yeah, I know. I know. Okay. Anyways, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, hopefully that helps you, Alex, and hopefully you can find something within your local area to get rid of that stuff responsibly. Yes, Rick, you can do target practice with your old drives. Oh, that, that is what that is what David Sims over at Hippo would, for MSPs would tell you to do as well. Nice, I like it. I like it. That's cool. <laughs> That's a good idea. Good idea. I need some shooting practice. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> So let's say this says, hello, Jeff. Thank you for the help and keep up the good work with pod nuts. Y'all are fun to listen to and watch with all kinds of information. And this is from Robert's computer services, Robert Eiler. Thank you, Robert. And we had had some back and forth. He had asked me for some documents I shared with him and he was just writing back saying, Hey, appreciate what y'all do. And believe it or not, I, and John, I'm sure you're the same way. I appreciate every message people send us telling us what a good job we're doing. Cause sometimes you're out there and you're like, Hey, is anybody really listening to me? Does anybody really care? <laughs> so, uh, that's why I like the Facebook group too. I, yes. I, I really enjoy just reading the questions. Even if I don't have an answer, it makes me you no know, thought provoking. Absolutely. It's awesome. All right. Let's see. This one is, uh, Oh, this is from Alex. Hey, Jeff, I was listening to your latest computer repair podcast, episode number 280, and I wanted to offer a solution to having hidden partitions show up after doing a Windows update in the screenshots I have here. Now, here's here's something awesome that I appreciate that and a lot of people do this, but Alex in particular sent me screenshots of what exactly I needed to do. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share the steps because this was something that came up where I did the 1803 update on my Dell Latitude. And it created the recovery partition, which is 449 megabytes. It created a drive letter on that partition. So basically, what solved that? What solved that solution? I'm going to go through it here in a minute. Is I use this part in the command line. I, you know, you can't use Windows. You can't use disk management. I probably could have used another part, like partition magic or something like that. But disk part was easy peasy. 30 seconds in and out. Got rid of the drive letter. Everything's back. I'm not getting any more errors on uh, letting it me letting me know that I have low disk space on this particular partition because it's just a Windows 10 recovery partition is what it is. All right, so uh, step one in disk management. Oh, this is uh, in in disk management. Well, you know what? I'm not going to go through all this, but I'm going to put the steps out there that you can go through to basically look at these and get rid of that drive letter if you get one that's created by accident because obviously this is a single drive. And I don't know why 1803 on only this particular computer I've seen it actually created a partition, a D drive. So, um, says hope this is a long-term solution. Although 
since a Windows update caused the issue in the first place, they may have to be redone. Thanks again for all your great content. Regards, Alex Albert. And no, I don't like redoing computers, so this was a godsend. Um, thank you very much. All right. What do you think about that? Uh, one of those the latest posts uh, Neil put in the Computer Repair Podcast group about the $15 per month plus tax for uh, Office Depot on-demand remote tech support. Did you see that? <laughs> I did see that. And it's one of those things I've seen those pop up periodically time and time again. Um, let's just, uh, let's go back to, I don't know. What was the, uh, what was the company? We had comp USA years ago and I can't remember if they, I, I don't know if they ever got into fixing computers or anything like that. Um, but there was a, what was the well, last who, company? Who they just buy like, so office Depot and office max merged, right? Now they just bought some huge tech company. I mean, a really big one. I can't remember what the name of it is. So now that now they're trying to leverage that, obviously through the stores. Okay, it, I've seen these come and go, and usually, a lot of times, these companies will start to provide these services. Um, what was the one, Fire Dog or something like that? The next thing you know, they're out of business. Um, these things don't last. And here's the thing: the support you're going to get. Is oh, going to CompuCom. Be, yeah, com, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the support you're going to get is going to be poor at best. You're probably going to have somebody in another country. Not that that's a bad thing, but they're going to be going through a phone tree or a a, a, a internet tree of what they're going to tell you on how to fix your computer, or they might do a scan or whatever. But they're not going to have a real one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody that know that that knows, likes, and trusts you. And I think that's where the issue comes in. Um, I'm looking for the dedicated people out there that really know, like, and trust me and are willing to spend the money, whether it's $25 per computer, $50 per computer, because I'm doing a lot more for them. And because of that, I, I think these other things will come and go. I mean, Best Buy was doing it when you would bring in a computer. Basically, you had to pay them, I think it was... Two hundred dollars was one ninety nine before they would even look at the computer and fix your problem, and that was for antivirus and basically one year of support, and it pretty much just cleanups, antivirus support, that type of thing. It's not like they did anything for you, and so you look at that. That's even that was even fairly cheap for uh, for what they were doing there. In the picture somebody posted, I can't read the fine print. I'm just really wondering what that includes. Again, it's more like right. the set it and forget it type things, right? <laughs> uh, all right, let me go on. So there was one more on the hidden drive issue that I had, and this is from Nathan Peterson. It says, hey, Jeff, I read on Spiceworks a couple weeks ago. It's a solution to the low storage D drive recovery image problem you brought up in the latest podcast. And thanks for the quality podcast. You are welcome. Nathan Peterson. All right, so it goes back into, and basically a lot of these articles and what a lot of people pointed to uh, was disk management. And the one thing that did work was disk, disk part in the command line. So um, it was nice to have that. All right, John, I think we're, I think we're out. I think we're done. You got anything else? Jeff, if you're happy, I'm happy. Isn't that the way this works? Pretty much. Okay. Um, if you want to let people know, uh, you know, maybe uh, one parting thought and let them know where they could find you or catch up with you. I know what you're going to say. You know, happy summer to everybody. I'll see you on the Computer Repair Podcast group. Awesome. All right. Let's see. Come join us live for the Computer Repair Podcast every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern over at podnets.com forward slash CRP live. Join in on the conversation by hanging out in the chat room. You can send an email to podnuts at podnuts.com or leave a voicemail at 734-335-1000. Thank everyone for listening and subscribing to the show. We'll see you next time on the Computer Repair Podcast.